Welcome to M&A Mondays, the UK's first YouTube series dedicated to all things M&A. From interviews with the leading figures in the industry, to coffee chats with analysts, diversity panels, all the way through to workshops, we'll be covering it all. We do hope you enjoy the video and please give us a like and a follow on our social media. Thank you very much. Hello everyone uh, and welcome to this week's episode of m and Monday, the UK's first YouTube series dedicated to all things m and My name is Nicola and I'm the head of speaker relations uh, and today I'm joined by Toby, our speaker relations executive. We are delighted uh, to today host uh, Daniel Ross, the head of UK investment banking at Deutsche Bank. Oh yeah, just to give Daniel a suitable introduction, he started off as a solicitor at Ashurt, taking his first step into investment banking with Shooters. Since then, he's had 20 years of experience directing City, Morgan Stanley, and then chairing at Barclays. Most recently, he was poached by Deutsche Bank in a huge move leading into holding the position of head of investment banking here. We're absolutely delighted to have Daniel here with us today. So without further ado, let's get started. Uh, hi, Daniel. How are you? I'm very well, Toby. How are you? Amazing. Hi, Nicola, as well. And um, just to go over the First question, as Toby mentioned, over the course of your career, you have worked at multiple bull bracket banks such as City, Morgan Stanley and Barclays. Now, what prompted you to join Deutsche Bank and what opportunity did you see in this uh, decision? Sure. Well, as I say, thanks for having me again. Um, and I mean, I think that's a very interesting question because you know, one question that's related that I've been asked often is, you know, how different are, are the banks? You know, they're, they're all bulge bracket banks, you know, they do things, um, but they actually are different. Um, and to answer this particular question, um, I, you know, as you say, I've been at a number of different institutions, but I've been at, well, I, I think, three main institutions. I was at um, Schroeder's City uh, for nine years. Schroeder's uh, was a UK investment bank that was acquired. Then Salomon Smith Barney, but part of Citigroup, all became Citigroup um, subsequently. So that was one organization. I was there for nine years. I was there for three years, and um, most recently Barclays for 12 years. Um, and um, and now obviously Deutsche Bank and the, and the short answer um, is that you know um, moving is 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 actually quite a um, it's quite a big deal um, moving job is a big deal particularly when you've been in an institution for 12 years it's a bit like you know moving school I always think um, you know you build up a network you build up friends um, they like those you don't like. You know where the uh, the bodies are buried, as it were, um, and it's a big it's a big thing to you know to move institution, particularly when um, you've built up a, a strong reputation as well. And the reason I did it actually is because um, I, I felt that Deutsche Bank was at an inflection point in its uh, evolution. Um, it's a bank that you know historically has had some issues, like many have, um, but. The recent strategy is, has begun to pay off. The the stock price is moving in the in the right direction. The investment banking business, I think, is a very high quality business. It's actually the largest business within the the group, um, which is quite unique if you look at all the other European banks and the American banks. Um, you'll find it hard to identify another bank where the investment bank is actually the largest revenue generator uh, within the organisations. Tends to be one of the smaller businesses. Certainly was. Uh, one of the not, not the largest of Barclays, and certainly true for many of the Americans, if not all of the Americans, other than um, the pure investment banks, and it's also true for the other Europeans like Credit Suisse, UBS, etc. So, for Deutsche, it's it's the, it's the largest, which means it's the most important um, and the most critical for the for the organisation to get right. And I think the path where the path looking forward 
And the opportunity for Deutsche, particularly in the UK, I think is considerable because Deutsche, I think once upon a time, was the market leader in the UK and in investment banking. It hasn't been that recently, but it's got all the tools to get, get back there. Um, it's the leader, or obviously, in Germany and in much of continental Europe. Uh, but in the UK, it's needed, I think, more, a, a bit more investment and a bit more um, guidance a, a, and strategy as to how it should um, improve its, um, its rankings. And, and that, I think, is the opportunity because the people here are very strong individuals. Uh, we've got great uh, connectivity across different sectors, across different products. Uh, across geographies as well, obviously into the continent and the US. And I think the brand here is also very strong. You know, it's known to be a very, a very large global investment bank. So I, to me, there was very significant opportunity in moving, um, an opportunity to run the UK business, which I thought was interesting as well. And, you know, my history at Barclays most recently, John, having joined in 2009 when they just bought the Neiman Brothers business in the US, was a history of building businesses. Um, so we built that business and I was focused there on the TMT business in particular, but we, you know, we built that business from 2009 when there was really only a lending business at Barclays into a you know, multi-product advisory led um, investment banking business. And, and I think there's a strong and interesting opportunity to do that here at Deutsche. So that's, that's a sort of summary as, as to why I've, um, why I've moved. Thank you so much for the answer. It's really interesting to hear about that. Um, yeah, reading about your move into Deutsche Bank, it was followed with a range of hires by the bank in this European investment banking business. When it was trying to expand and capitalize and create, you know, momentum over the last year. Uh, can you just tell us about the short-term goals you want to achieve with Deutsche Bank in the next year, as well as your long-term goals you want to achieve in the next couple of years? Yeah, sure. Well, the, the short-term goals I actually just bring some more good people into the organisation and into the UK business in particular. And you know, we've already done that um, in spades. So, uh, and I've only been here two and a half months or so. Um, but we've already hired five MDs into the UK business, um, and we want to hire more good people at all levels in the UK business and into the into the bank more broadly. Um, so we you know we are we are adding people. We're, we're a big business. Um, investment banking is a you know is a tutelage sponsor led business. Uh, we need good people at all levels, from you know graduates up. Um, we've now hired a number of senior bankers into, into our business, and in the short term, the goal is you know to continue just to add good people, at, as I say, at all levels to make sure that the team is properly built out and fit for purpose, which I think in relatively short order um, it will be. I think the longer term goals um, are more complex in the sense that you know, we want to uh, continue to grow the business, obviously, at the top line, but also in the context of meaningful client relationships. What I've said, what I've said to, um, you know, to media organizations generally is we want to put clients at the at, at the center of what we do in a sort of old fashioned banking our way. So rather than you know, thinking of our clients as vehicles for different products that we offer, whether it's M&A, whether it's leveraged finance, equity, IPOs, whatever it may be, we need to think of our clients as the center of our universe. And I think that's what we'll do and how we'll run the business going forward. Um, and what that means, I think ultimately is obviously that we want to use that to grow the top line revenues of the business um uh, you know as we move forward but you know those 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 are longer term goals which will fall out of the way that we operate and the conversations the increased level of interactivity and conversations that we have with our clients and that's i think what we uh, what what we aim for in the sort of medium to the longer term well Thank you for that outline of your uh, future plans. Now, for this question, uh, I want to go a bit back now uh, because of the COVID uh, pandemic and the circumstances that it brought. How did it actually impact the investment banking industry? And are there any sectors that have performed well, regardless of the pandemic? And will, will you now look to further expand operations in those sectors that have performed uh, well? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I, I mean, you know, the answer is is in a way is a fairly obvious answer. I mean, you guys can tell me 
you know, what you used during the pandemic and what you didn't use. I mean, it's fairly obvious, right? None of us were getting on a plane. Um, none of us were going into the office um, uh, to the extent we had an office. You know, less relevant for you guys, perhaps. But, um, um, you know, and many of us were ordering uh, our supermarket um, food and, and groceries online. Same for uh, everything else online. Um, same for, you know, general food delivery, deliveries of the world and uh, Just Eat, etc. Um, you know, no one was going to the theater, no one was going to the cinema, no one was going on a cruise. You know, it, it's, it's fairly obvious, I think, who the winners and losers of the pandemic were and are in terms of businesses, same for pharmaceuticals, you know, industrial companies, etc. Um, so I think we could all probably quite easily draw up a list of companies who we think profited and those that didn't. But it's more the answer from an investment banking perspective is not just about winners and losers, because actually, you know, companies that are struggling in and, and struggled during the pandemic are still significant users of investment banks. You know, if you if you take um, the airlines, for example, or you know other leisure businesses that clearly were you know where business was completely shut during the pandemic. They had to sustain their businesses during that period of time, and therefore had to raise. Many of them had to raise equity in the capital markets, or you know they had to uh, elongate the tenure of their debt. Um, all of which obviously require investment banking services. Others, for example, want to take advantage of the fact that their stock may have been trading high and were looking to do M and A deals. So what we found actually is is not so much um, that you know we want to to gear our business towards just the winners, but actually that we want to maintain relationships across the piece and help clients who are struggling as well as those that are doing well out of the pandemic, and just be at the center of those conversations so that we can assist them in whatever they need uh, our services for, um, given where their businesses were and and will likely be as we look forward. So it's a sort of mixed picture in that regard. Uh, what I would say, though, is you know clearly, you know, if you look more broadly and link, don't link it to the pandemic, there are clearly some sectors that are more active than others. Um, and you know, though, again, you could probably, you guys could probably list them as much as I could. But you know, within TMT and tech, and you know, specifically, there's obviously a lot of activity. There's a lot of activity within pharma. There's a lot of activity within consumer. Uh, and e-commerce, et cetera. A lot within business services, uh, there's a lot of sponsor activity, financial sponsor, private equity activity across all of those sectors. Um, and you know, there's, a, there's an ongoing debate around ESG and energy transference and structural changes within that market as well, which is impacting our clients and obviously therefore uh, our interaction with them and their desire and ability to do both financing and advisory work. So. All of those things are impacting our clients and therefore um, uh, impacting the way we do business. I think there are structural themes around you know, tech, around energy uh, and ESG in particular, um, and around, in the case of the UK, obviously the impact of Brexit, which are broad themes that are impacting businesses across the piece. But you know, those themes will continue um, with or without the pandemic. Um, and I'm sure there'll be themes that continue to impact the level of business that we see across the different sectors. What we have seen uh, coming out of all of that is very um, significant increase in investment banking activity across advisory, across financing, equity and debt uh, over the last 12, 18 months. And that's, I think, been a factor that we've seen across most geographies and uh, we have certainly profited from that um, increased level of activity, as have I think, uh, as have all of our competitors. You know, thank you. That's it's really really interesting to see the idea of winners and losers from the perspective of an investment bank. Like, if we look at Zoom, for example, something like this, an interview over Zoom before the pandemic would have been absurd. But now they have like a huge platform to make a lot of business now. But yeah, moving on to the next question. You've had lots of experience and been very successful over the last 20 years. Was there any like particular turning point in your career that helped you get to the position you are? Like, just to expand on the question, what would you say were the necessary traits that really gave you as much success as you've been able to achieve? 
Well, it's kind of you to um, to articulate my success in that way. Um, I'd be more. I'd, I'd certainly be more um, reticent to do so. But but um, um, look, I think there are uh, you know there 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 are points in one's career which uh, where you make you know significant decisions um, that have a lasting uh, a long lasting impact. Um, I made a decision early on in my career not to be a lawyer but to be a banker, for example. Um, you know, I trained, I studied law. I then went on to um, to law school and did my training contract uh, and qualified as a lawyer. And shortly afterwards, I, I moved into banking. Um, and that was a you know significant decision, particularly obviously after having put the um, the effort into qualify as a lawyer. And it's something I don't regret at all doing because um, you know that set me obviously on the path of of banking. I I, I find everything these these decisions are quite personal but i i certainly find being a banker more interesting person you know than being a lawyer um you're at the you know the heart of decision making mm -hmm. the heart of interacting with very senior the most senior representatives of businesses uh, and that's i think more interesting than in my view at least than the, the sort of the academic uh, approach to contractual negotiations um so that was one turning point I think the others are, you know, when you move firm, and I, as I mentioned earlier, moving firm is, you know, is a big deal. Um, you leave, you know, as I, as I referenced earlier, it's a bit like leaving friends and family behind. Um, and those are those are moments in time, as as mine has have been very recently, where you know you you have to make a decision, and uh, and those decisions can have very profound consequences, good and bad. Um, I think those are points where you reflect quite meaningfully as to whether or not you're in the right place um, and, uh, you know, in the future and the impact that, that they will have, those decisions will have on your on your career. Um, luckily for me, I've made some quite good choices, I think, in that regard. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, you have to think again quite carefully of all of the pros and cons around these decisions when you make them. Um, the, the more nuanced answer though, so th those are sort of obvious points, frankly. The more nuanced answer though is I think every, t every day when you make the little decisions about what you do and how you do it, do you interact with certain individuals? You know, should you push a little bit harder around a given situation? Do I go and speak to my boss about something that, you know, an idea or something that's on my mind, whatever it may be? Those are the things that actually make a real difference. Um, to your career, I think, and I would encourage everyone to, you know, to be more, not less, vocal. And that would be my sort of, you know, nugget of, of advice if there is one, which is, you know, don't don't sit back and sort of, you know, we have people, by the way, in in this organisation, many others. When you when we have group meetings, there are some people that sit sit forward at the table, and there are some that sit at the back of the table and and sort of want to be. You know, don't want to be noticed. So my advice is be noticed, um, and you know, be speak up, um, because people always want to hear different views, and it doesn't matter what level you are. You know, you guys will have a much better view, for example, around many businesses that we interact with than I will, because you know, it's your, it, you're more attuned to some of those businesses and interact with them more than I do. Um, so we're always interested to hear. Uh, diverse and different views and I think the more people that, that offer those the better and then then you get noticed and I think that's always helpful in the context of, of your career. Thank you for that advice and now for this question I also want to touch upon what you mentioned previously of putting back those uh, putting back the clients at the center of investment banking now uh, as you gain seniority throughout your career, how have your interactions actually uh, altered with clients? And is there any advice you'd give yourself from the beginning on how to successfully build those uh, long-lasting relationships with clients? Yeah, I, it's not another good question. Like I, I, I would say the first, the, the, the best piece of advice there is um, to put yourself in your client's shoes. Um, so you always approach things from their perspective. Um, you know, in, in its simplest form, and I don't want to belittle what we do, but in its simplest form, 
much of what we do, particularly on the M&A side, is we are broking, we're, we're like a, a, an intermediary, right? A, a broker between a buyer and a seller. And we facilitate transactions between a buyer and a seller. Uh, and of course, it's more complex than that. But, but you know, at its simplest form, that's what it is. And I think when you think about it in that way, and think about, you know, for example, a simple transaction of when you're buying or selling your, you know, property, or you're buying a flat or a house, whatever it may be. You know, what do you, if you're in the shoes of a buyer in that situation, think about what you want to achieve. Um, and same, similarly for a seller. And when you think about it in those simple terms as a banker and think about what your clients want to do when they're sitting in those seats, then I think you'll give them the best advice. And also you'll, you'll appreciate how they're coming at situations um, and what is important to them. You know, some things will be important, some things will be less important. Getting the deal done ultimately will be important, of course, at the right price, depending on whether you're looking at it, looking to get a cheaper or, 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 or uh, whether you're a buyer or seller. Um, but, you know, put your, always put yourself in their shoes and I think that will, then you'll think in the right way around what, what matters to them. Always be, you know, honest around advice. Never try and sugarcoat um, uh, bad news as well. It's always better to be upfront. Um, and I think also just try and be um, engaging and engaged with clients. You know, people like to do business ultimately with people that they like. That's the simple truth. No one likes to do business with people they don't like. Um, that's as true in our business as it is in any other. So building relationships and having good EQ as well as IQ, very, very important. You know, the skills that bankers need ultimately or a mix of, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting job ours. Uh, uh, this comes back probably to one of your uh, uh, latter questions, but you know, it, it's, it's the skills that we need are really entrepreneurial skills. You need some EQ to understand and, and interact with clients, as well as obviously very strong academics to understand complex situations and, um, and financing, et cetera. Um, and, and it's quite rare to require all of those skills, I think, in, in one role. But banking is, is a bit like that. You're a, mix of, you're a mix of an employee and an entrepreneur, and that's what makes ultimately the best banker. Wow, yeah, thank you for that insight. Um, yeah, following on to our next question, we just wanted to know um, about your recent transactions throughout your career. So yeah, out of all the transactions you've worked on, are there any that particularly stood out um, well, I've worked on so many, you know, it's difficult to uh, know. I, I, um, I, uh, there are obviously transactions that stand out. I mean, I've worked on the um, um, selling Sky to Comcast, for example, was a significant transaction in the UK uh, a few years back. Um, very recently, I advised the Stars Group, uh, as in Poker Stars, on the combination of Stars with Flutter. Um, which is now obviously a, you know, a, um, a very large for 200 company. Um, and very recently I sold William Hill to Caesars and then sold parts of William Hill onto Triple Eight, another gaming transaction. And um, another interesting one actually is um, Cineworld. You know, we acted and I acted for Cineworld um, in different transactions. First three, firstly, combining was a business called Cinema City with Cineworld in the UK to create a large pan-European business, and then Cineworld, uh, subsequently buying Regal, the, U the second largest operator in the US, um, become the second largest global operator of cinemas. It was a very interesting, that was a particularly interesting transaction because, um, and this is obviously pre-pandemic, the, um, you know, the, <clears throat> the um, cinema trade, I think is a very interesting business, because it relies on really um, a content that you don't own or control. It relies on selling a lot of popcorn um, and it relies on getting people into, into your boxes, um, you know, on a continued basis, notwithstanding, you know, many of the other calls on their leisure time, including streaming and, and other home services, obviously, which have grown considerably over recent years. And there are lots of skeptics around that business. I'm, a, I'm actually a, 
um, I'm a, a bull on cinemas going forward. I, I, I think they're here to stay, but you know they've been clearly very impacted by the pandemic. Um, in my earlier commentary, and um, and many of the businesses in that sector, I think you know have have struggled significantly, and some of them probably won't won't make it through the pandemic. But but ultimately, I think as we come out the other side, they're still very interesting businesses. And um, I suspect that people will go back to the, we've already seen that in the UK actually that particularly with the Bond film people are going back uh, in meaningful volumes already. Uh, I suspect that will continue subject to obviously Hollywood producing things that people want to see. Um, but you know again an interesting business an interesting transaction um, that we did a few couple of years ago largely because why was it interesting? It was interesting because it was a large transaction. It was cross-border transaction. It involved um, raising debt, raising equity, uh, a family controlling the business, maintaining their stake, um, et cetera. It involved many of the things that we try and help our clients with, um, uh, but all of them rolled into one. Amazing. Thank you on that. Um, you already gave a lot of advice, but uh, just to remind it all up for this last question. Uh, what advice would you give to students looking to uh, now pursue their career in investment banking and what can they expect from this industry? Yeah, well, look, I think um, investment banking, I, I still think, and I referenced this a bit earlier, but I, I still think investment banking is a very interesting career. Um, finance, you know, and banks are still very much at the epicenter of, you know, global economies and will always continue to, to, to be. And, and, you know, banks and finance have always been, I think, a, you know, a very interesting industry and critical, obviously, to the functioning of, uh, of large scale economies. Um, that won't change. And I think being in an investment bank um, and having the opportunity to engage, uh, and again, I referenced this earlier, but having the opportunity to engage with um, corporations at the very highest level with chairman, CEO, CFOs of the largest businesses across the globe is pretty unique at a pretty young age. Um, and, you know, we have the ability to do that. We're lucky. Um, we have, um, you know, the, 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 the luck that um, what we do is actually interesting for our clients. It's the most, typically the most important thing that they're engaged on. If they're doing an M&A transaction, you know, that's the, their entire focus um, for a period of time. Because it is so important to the to be to make sure it's successful, um, and I think that's you know that's a privileged position to be in, and it makes it makes the job very demanding but very interesting, um, and a great training ground. I think also you know in terms of finance, in terms of people skills, in terms of again as I referenced earlier, in terms of entrepreneurship, I think it combines all of those things into one into one field, and um, it's uh, it's a very interesting. Uh, role, I think, as a consequence of that. So I, I think it's here to stay. Um, it's super interesting. I'd encourage, you know, anyone who's listening to this to, um, um, you know, to explore it further, and you know, do your homework. Think about it in in detail. Think about which parts of the bank are interesting. Um, think about which banks, um, you know, you might want to to talk to. And the more you engage, the more that people will recognize. To my other point again, the more you engage, the more people will recognize you as an individual and want to hire you. Um, we want to hire high quality people here at Deutsche Bank, and uh, I, I'm sure many of your um, many of your cohort are, are in that bracket. So you know, we're we're very happy to speak to them. Oop, you're on mute, I think, Toby. Sorry. Yeah, thank you so much. Amazing advice just as spring week start closing. Um, yeah, so thank you for your time. Thank you for taking time out of your day. I hope the, the watchers enjoyed that interview as much as I did. Uh, so yeah, just closing up. Thank you. Peace. And pleasure. Excuse thank, me. Thank you both. To our viewers, please do also consider of liking this video and subscribing to our channel.